in terms of preparing um, for space flight, you know, I, I tweeted about this and I joked about it. And I, I talked to Elon quite a lot these days. What I tweeted was, I'd like to do a podcast in space one day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a silly thing. Uh, Cause I was thinking for some reason in my mind, I was thinking 10, 20 years from now. And then I realized like, wait, why not like now? It, yeah. There's no, just even seeing what uh, Axiom is doing, what Inspiration4 is doing, it's like yeah. regular civilians could just could go. start going up. Well, so let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. When do you think, we saw Jeff Bezos go out into orbit. When do you think Elon goes up to space? So his thinking about this is it's partially responsible until it's safe because he has such a, uh, direct engineering roles in the running of multiple companies. Yeah. So at which point do you think, what's your prediction for the year that Elon will go up? I think he'd probably go up by 2026, 20, I would say, uh, because the number of missions planned, th there'll be pr several missions per year through multiple space agencies and companies that are really making low Earth orbit very routine. And by go up, I think it might also, for example, the Inspiration4 mission just went up for three days in flight. You, you know, and it was enough time to get up there, do some experiments, enjoy the view, and then you came back. Uh, the Axiom missions are a bit more complicated. There's docking, you're up in the space station, it's a shared atmosphere, so you have to follow all the ISS protocols. What's what's interesting about the Dragon capsule and the Inspiration4 and some of these what are called free flyer missions, you can just launch into space. You basically have your own little mini space station for a few days. Mm -hmm. It's not that big, right? But... I think that's what we'd probably see him do first because they're fair. They're you know we're going to see a lot more tests of those in the next three two three years, but they're already already been demonstrated to be safe. And then you're not trying to go for ten to twenty days or, or months or years at a time. It's just up in space for a few days, but you're in proper space. It's an orbital flight. It's not just a suborbital flight. You're uh, you could do the podcast from there. And I think 2026. I wonder how the audio works. See, also, can you comment on 2026? I'll, I'll start getting ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start pushing him on this. I'm quite quite serious. It's a fascinating kind of... Axiom 2 still has room. You could go on that mission if you want. So I'll ask you about Axiom. Um, what? How strict are these? So this, <laughs> this seems surreal that civilians are traveling up. So <laughs> how, many, how much bureaucracy is there still in your experience for the scientific? I mean, I know it's a difficult question to ask a scientist because you get to, you know, you don't want to complain too much. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah. how much, you know, there's sometimes bureaucracy with NSF and DOD and the funding and all those kinds yeah, of things yeah. um, that kind of prevent you from being as free as you might sometimes like to to do all kinds of wild experiments and crazy experiments. Now, the benefit of that is that you don't do any wild and crazy experiments that hurt people. Right, right. And so it's very important to put safety first, but it's like a dance. A little too much restrictions and bureaucracy can hamper the flourishing of science. Mm -hmm. A little too little of that can get some uh, crazy scientists to start doing unethical experiments. Okay, mm -hmm. that said, NASA and just spaceflight in general is sort of famously very, uh, very uh, risk averse. Yes. So what's your sense currently about like, even like doing a podcast, right? A podcast, you know, unless it's a, you know, I think with uh, mixed martial arts is a pretty safe activity, you know, unless you're doing a, the octagon version of your podcast should, should I mean just getting there and back is the only real risky part which is still risky right but i think you're, you're not asking to do you know open heart surgery in space you're just saying what if i do a podcast and i think well fun you're trying to ask to have fun yes and i feel like fun sounds dangerous any kind of fun uh, it, well, that's what's been extraordinary is that traditionally yes i think most of the space agencies have been very by definition bureaucratic because they're coming from the government and but they've been been that way for a really good reason is that safety you know in the early 60s we know almost nothing about the body in space except for you know some of the work that pilots had done at really high altitudes so we really didn't know what at all to expect so it's good that there were decades of resolute focus on just safety but now we know it's pretty safe we know this physiological responses we know what to expect we can also treat some of it we hopefully hopefully soon we'll treat a lot more of it but if you just want to go up there it's actually now it's just a question of cost like imagine I think the way you can view a lot of the commercial spaceflight companies is that 
if you have the funds, you can basically plan the mission. All the training they'll do is to help you get prepared for how you run some of the instrumentation, how you can fly the rocket to a limited degree, and how to use some of the equipment. But fundamentally, it's no longer a question of you know, years and years of training and selection, this impossible odds task of becoming an astronaut. It's frankly just a question of funds. Expensive plane rides. So yeah, how much, right. how much you mentioned Axiom, well, uh, is it known how much the it costs pr for the plane ride? There is no official number and it depends on the mission, of course. So the, if you ask them, well, often they'll say, well, how serious are you? They really want, they don't just want to give out random numbers to people. Right. Uh, but the numbers of, because for example, we propose one mission, we want a new twin study where someone goes up and stays up there for 500 to 550 days. But to basically be up there for the longest time ever to simulate the time it would take to get to Mars and back for the shortest possible duration, about 550 days. Because uh, if you went there and immediately turned around, you could maybe make that mission. Otherwise, it's a three-year mission. The And there we, you know, the, it's you're looking at the ranges of, you know, it's 50 to $100 million in that ballpark range. But the reason it's so variable is it depends. What are you doing up there? If you're up there, for example, for two two years, basically, almost you know, almost two years, that's a long time to just be in one spot, right? So could you be doing some things where you're, you, know, it's, you can your time is valuable, so you can do experiments and people pay for those, and that, that defrays the cost. Or you could build something, or you could do podcasts and maybe you know fundraise on the podcast. Yeah. And so there's, as long as you, the reason the cost is variable is because it depends. Well, do you have all the money? And you say, I want to go and just sit in space for two years and do nothing. Well, then you have to pay for all that time that you're up there if you want to do things. And yeah, I see the the official X one mission was fifty five million for a trip to the ISS. Uh, <laughs> it's not that bad. It could be worse. <laughs> Wait, I uh, Sergey just posted a thirty five thousand dollar price tag per night per person on the ISS. Is that real? I don't know. <laughs> no, that sounds about right. That's why. That's like a real hotel stay. So to stay. Oh, so interesting. Um, and then I'm sure there's costs with the docking and all those kinds of things. That's from the perspective of Axiom, the private company, or That's SpaceX, or whoever is right. whoever is paying the cost and uh, in the short term and in the, in the long term. Yeah. And then think about it, a lot of that cost is rocket fuel. Like yeah. A lot of it is the ride. So it's, I've been on calls where Axiom's like, "Hey, SpaceX, give us to make it a little cheaper. We can make it cheaper on our end." It's yeah. the cost that that is the rocket. 